so we're on chapter 26 of your world history and we're going to be talking about the cold war so let me give you this quote by ronald reagan in 1985 to the national evangelicals he says i urge you to be aware of the temptation to declare yourselves above it all and label both sides equally at fault to ignore the facts of history and aggressive impulses of an evil empire. To simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. So what he's saying, basically, during the Cold War, we have the nationalist uh, free enterprise um, nations um, coming against communism and communism, that Cold War, infil infiltrating into all the nations of the world. So in the top um, left corner there, you have a picture of the atomic bomb in World War II, which um, Truman had dropped in Japan. And so now we have countries, um, the United States as one, and soon to be the, um, the communist countries having the atomic bomb too. The Cold War and onto in the right you see um, after World War II, you see Stalin and um, Truman and Churchill here um, making that agreement to end World War II. And World War II had to be, uh, um, was involved with the Axis nations, as, as you remember, with Germany, yeah, with Hitler and Germany and Mussolini and on to Japan. So the, this war, after the dropping of the atomic bomb on Japan, the war um, ended in the Pacific. So let's go on from this point. We're going to go on um, and we're going into different, there's going to be eight sections here, and it's all going to have to do with the Cold War and communism. So let's go on to the first. First, we're going to talk about the United Nations. Not my favorite subject, as the United Nations to me throughout history didn't and it has done nothing for peace. But the United Nations were supposedly to be an organization for peace. So after the use of the atomic bomb, people, of course, feared nuclear war now. And most people in the world wanted some kinds of peace organization. They did not want to experience an atomic bomb. The League of Nations under Woodrow Wilson, as you know, in, the, in World War I, had failed in producing per peace. In fact, World War II had started, right? And the world leaders planning peace now, many Americans now were accepting the idea, which they didn't really accept the League of Nations, but now they were prepared to, to accept the United Nations. But both those who favored the United Nations would find it would be a great disappointment, for it failed to oppose the greatest threats of peace that the world has ever known and that is communism. So you see here in the corner here, you see the League of Nations, you know, and they're talking it over um, and about different things going on in the midst of warmongers, right in the midst um, of, of their group. So it was very, um, I'd say, conflicting for the United Nations to have um, nations that were at war um, in the United Nations. And so, the failures of the League of Nations. I like this picture here. You have Britain and France and Italy. It says, um, basically, Italy that time with Mussolini. We don't want you to fight, but by jingo, if you do, we'll probably issue a memorandum suggesting a disapproval of you. <laughs> so, the League of Nations had little power at that time. And now, would the United Nations have power? Hmm. And now that we had the atomic bomb, people were looking for peace. The forming of the United Nations. Okay, how did the United Nations come about? Well, um, at the end of World War II, we had President FDR, that's Roosevelt, right here, and we have Churchill, and basically they got together at the Atlantic Charter to discuss the United Nations. On January 1942, 26 nations allied against the Axis powers. Remember the Axis powers were basically Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, onto um, Mussolini's Italy, and of course, Japan. 
And now that they, the Axis powers were defeated by the dropping of the atomic bomb, um, the United Nations would set the, a declaration. So they would agree, these 26 nations would agree on the declarations by the United Nations. So in 1944, Dunbar Barton Oaks in Washington, D.C., um, they drew up plans for the United Nations. And on April 25th, 1945, 1,600 delegates met from 50 nations in San Francisco, California to draft the charter for the United Nations. Here's a picture of all these um, cut representatives of these countries. So in 1945, President Harry Truman says, we must build a new world, far better world, one in which dignity of man is respected. So he was wanting to build between nations a, a, a utopia type world, a world where we could have peace, right? Well, President Truman, of course, he became president because FDR here had a stroke at the end of the world and Truman had to take over. So now Truman had to, his idea was, he, as, was drafting some sort of peace. And since the League of Nations didn't work, we would go on to, to form the United Nations. So on January 26, 1946, after two months of meetings, uh, the delegates adopted the United Nations Charter and the United Nations became that peace organizing um, group um, for all the nations involved. So United Nations. So let's find out a little more about the United Nations here. The first meeting of the United Nations um, General Assembly so was on London in Lind I'm sorry in London, England on January 10th, 1946. So in London. So we go from Washington DC to San Francisco and the first meeting being in London. The United Nations then received a gift of $8.5 million from a financier, John D. Rockefeller Jr. Hmm. Here's a picture of him right here. So he funds the United Nations. And him, too, being a very liberal um, type of uh, political, in the political realm, uh, in funding um, this, uh, actually, too, member of the Masons. Illuminati. Well, we'll get into that some other time. But they also had a gift of land donated from the city of New York. New York City donated the land for the UN. And a loan came from the United States government for $65 million. In 1952, the United Nations then occupied this new building in New York City. You can see this where they met, this building in New York. The framework of the United Nations. There's three parts that you need to know. And we'll look, the first is the um, General Assembly, and that's all the members there. Now it's 193 members, and each member has one vote regardless of its size. So, and, um, and the discussions happen and votes, they, they each have their vote to vote on what the Security Council puts out. So then on to the Security Council. The Security Council has five members, um, were five founding members, I should say, and permanent members, and they are the United States, Great Britain, France, Soviet Union, and China. You see here now we have two communist members in the midst of the Security Council. They also have 10 elected members, and um, communist China replaced in 1971, um, first was nationalist China, and then it turned to communism. And this, this Security Council was supposed to maintain world peace. So they would actually decide the final authority on the issues of peace and security. And um, all of the members of the UN must accept and implement, implement the decisions that are made by the Security Council. So they would decide on things. The General Assembly would vote, but they would decide on whatever. And then we have the Secretariat General, and basically that would be the managing of the day-to-day -day, um, business and making recommendations to the General Assembly. So here we have how these three parts work in the United Nations.
So, and actually there's other, there's other UN departments and organizations that deal with specific world affairs that come in and advise, kind of like a lobbying type system. The United Nations in 1995 had 185 members. Each one voted regardless of the population or size. And it also had a lot of third world members third world countries, um, poorer countries, that many of them were controlled by communist parties. So, and they have used the General Assembly as a world forum and sometimes to denounce the wealthy nations. You can see here the wet nations do not really get along in the UN, um, especially being divided by communism. And um, they would label the USA with the uh, United States as a capitalistic country and um, communist countries would advise and control the votes on some of these third world countries. And even though the United States has, been a, uh, has contributed far more um, to the development of third world countries than any other nations, the votes would come in as um, communist countries would control those leaders in those third world countries. So you can see how the United Nations votes would be um, uh, weighed, outweighed um, to certain certain countries and how they wouldn't um, agree, be very agreeable on many subjects, huh? Especially to do with the world peace. The failure of the United Nations. Since the beginning, the United Nations has been a colossal failure for peacekeeping. It has. Many even think it's been a threat to freedom around the world. Certainly it has failed and is a stated objective to maintain peace and cooperation. So the United Nations said they were peace. Well, they haven't really maintained peace or cooperations among nations. There have been hundreds of wars and aggressive attacks since the United Nations was formed. And it has failed to prevent or end any of these wars or any of these aggressive attacks. Indeed, the United Nations has aided the spread of communism by permitting communist aggression and expansion to go unchecked. I would call the United Nations, we did nothing, the do-nothings, right? So has the system a system failure or a failed system? I think it's a failed system. And here we have like the genocide in Rwanda and Sri Lanka and Myanmar, all these different things that the United Nations did nothing about. The root of the United Nations, the root of failure of the United Nations. So in the root of the United Nations is these ideologies. Um, and um, those that were present at the Dunbark and Oak, Oaks for where the United Nation was founded and, and in San Francisco have um, been represented as a lot of socialists and communists involved. Some were even Soviet agents. And we have um, Andre Romichael, and he was the head of a communist delegation of the Soviet Union, which was evolved in the forming of the United Nations. Hmm. And of course, we have the famous Elger Hiss. Elger Hiss being here, he was also an official in the United States Department, and he was implicated as a spy for the Soviet Union, spying on America. So here we have, you know, um, oh, actually this is Elger Hiss, and this is Andre Gromyko. And these are a bunch of spies that I found out um, and the New York legislator at that time that had um, communist background, um, possibly look, um, possibly um, you could trace back to the Soviet Union. So, so you can imagine how the United Nations would fail. The philosophy of the United Nations. The very heart of the United Nations is a collectivist philosophy which opposed individual freedom cherished and free nations like United States of America. History has shown that the United Nation continues to promote and pursue the humanistic and utopian goals of its founders. Claiming to seek world peace, 
while laying the foundation of a totalitarian one world government. Sound familiar? So what is collectivism? Collectivism means they collect the goals and the collection of goals are more important than individuals' goals and individual rights are not respective. And that's what happens in communism. They don't care so much about the individuals, but by they care about the philosophy of communism. In the modern world, collectivism is expressed through socialism. Socialism is similar to collectivism and communism, right? Individualism is the direct opposite, and it's basically where that individual's economic and political freedoms are ground rules on which society is based. We need to be based on individual freedom, not on communism and collectivism, and that's what the United Nations um, was founded on. So you'll find the United Nations could not do anything um, to help for peace. Um, especially because it was so divided between communism and the free nations um, that they would, they would always have a stalemate. So this sounds familiar even today as um, a lot of humanistic people are looking towards the utopian goals that one world order um, that talks about, that we talk about in the Bible of the coming of the Antichrist, the globalism. It's happening even now. So it's best to trust in the Lord Jesus with all your heart. Amen.